the rights group Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, has said security agencies killed 13,241 Nigerians since 2011, noting that extrajudicial killings by state actors has become the primary cause of deaths in the country. The organization also said Nigeria's democracy is experiencing a major setback, even as it's expressed concern over the shrinking civic space. Well, joining us to discuss this is legal practitioner Obin Chuku and uh, journalist Abdullahi Hassan. Thank you very much, Abdullahi, for joining us. Good evening. Um, I'm happy to be here one more time on your platform. Good evening. Great. So the last time you and I were having a conversation, or the last time you were here, we were talking about uh, the NSAS issue. And now we're talking oh, well. um, police brutality. Um, th the number is staggering. And, and that statistic is, I'm, suppose, I'm, I'm supposing it's supposed to be put side by side with COVID. And as at today, I checked the number of people who have died from COVID in Nigeria. It's not up to the number of people who have been killed. Uh, or have been victims of police brutality. Brutality. So, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to ask, start by asking, why do you think mm. that there's such high-handedness in Nigeria in terms of policing? Well, um, let me start first by saying that, yes, the report said about 13,000 uh, Nigerians have been killed in the last 10 years by security operatives. But again, I would like to warn that it is actually possible that first, the number could be higher. It could be double what we have because only what, what we have today are those that have been documented by CDC and other partner CSOs in Nigeria. Two, we should also be careful that um, they also mentioned that extrajudicial killings uh, is partly responsible for this. And I would like to state categorically here that they are referencing the northeast, uh, northeastern Nigeria where you have uh, insurgency. Um, you know, taking hold on the community and state uh, for the past, um, say, five years. Now, what we do have is that insurgents most times address the military uniforms or police uniforms and they go carry out attacks. So when victims will, will recollect um, their experiences, they'll reference the security operatives. So it may be possible, it is possible, we all know that, yes, security operatives do carry out extrajudicial killings, but again, we should be careful that insurgents also do dress in military camouflage or uniforms mm -hmm. and carry out attacks. So it may and may not be, but the number also could be double. Now, too, what we also know is that in countries like Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, uh, Chad, you know, and um, parts of CER, for instance, uh, wherever we have insurgency, wherever we have tr trouble, that is largely attributed to um, terrorism operations or activities, then civilian populations are bound to die in large numbers because at first there, there are some accusations by security operatives that this uh, civilian population are those who sell loud information to the insurgents who later carry out attacks, uh, you know, coordinated, coordinated attacks in court here mm -hmm. where a good number of soldiers are being killed and so sometimes when that happens, then there's a repressive attack um, from the military or, or security operatives, you know, wanting to revenge the killing of their colleagues. And when that happens, uh, what happens then is that we don't know. They, are, they, they find it hard to tell mm. who uh, a normal resident is because they all look alike. So whoever they see becomes a victim. Mm. So it, that's what I see. Back to policing. Um, we also know that the, the government uh, under President Muhammadu Buhari has introduced the soldiers into the civic space, which is not supposed to be. And soldiers are not necessarily trained to police. I, I, by the way, we're still protesting against police brutality. We're, we're talking about the rogue NSARS and the number of people mm -hmm. that were killed, people that were maimed. Exactly. But then with the, in, the reintroduction of the army into the civic space, if you follow the news, you saw, you must have seen a video of what happened in Imo State uh, and soldiers shooting down, um, you know, houses, burning places, uh, burning cars. Uh, this obviously was maybe as a result of one of their colleagues being killed. But we see this happening on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll paint another picture. If you were to be seen wearing, for example, something that looked like a, an army camouflage, or you probably maybe um, run into a, a soldier 
whether he be naval, he be of the army or the air force, you see the level of brutality that happens uh, because that person is in uniform. Again, I ask, why do you think that level of high-handedness uh, happens a lot in this particular country? Well, okay, so first off, this, the population don't know much about the fundamental human rights and freedoms, that is if they do. And wherever there is a provision, there are also limitations. Um, so what we do have is oftentimes these confrontations do occur when there are protests. So where does your right end as a peaceful protester? And when do you cross your bound? So uh, there need to be some sort of awareness campaign on some of these, these, these issues. For instance, we've seen this a lot of times, and you also, I'm, I'm sure as a journalist, you've seen some of this feed, where motorists, innocent motorists who are driving past um, a, a scene of protest, get their windshields broken, sometimes they get robbed by protesters. We don't care now who these people are. You know, it is easy to say that the protest was being hijacked, but by who? How is that possible? You know, so there needs to be some sort of understanding. First off, you know, that adequate um, sharing of knowledge, educating the population on what their fundamental human rights are and where the limitations also start or end. When that happens, there should be civic respect. And I'm sure, I'm just saying, I'm just saying this now, I'm sure that there will be some sort of, uh, sort of um, you know, control you know, and a, redu a reduction in the number of abuses, you know, or excessive use of force from security operatives. And also, and also I'm saying this now, not just Nigeria, but countries across Africa, particularly West Africa, the government has failed many times to prosecute just one police officer or a military officer before the entire nation, and just so, that it serves as an example or deterrent for other uh, uh, security operatives to behave themselves when they are being assigned national responsibility in terms of distress. Until there is justice, and I mean justice in all sense, I don't care who that person is, that person is my father or my brother, my uncle or who, so long you have been seen and caught with evidence like what I see right now on TV, a policeman have, has, has no right at all to abuse a civilian. You have no right to slap or torture them. You have to wait for the process, which means that you arrest them, you take them to, to the court, and you know whatever is being read against them, and then there will be verdict of this person or people. Mm -hmm. But until that is done, you have no right to abuse anybody. But this is what we see. So there needs to be prosecution, and I mean it, 100% and 20%, 120% prosecution of security operators. Talking about, talking about happen, prosecution, talking about knowing your rights. I like this conversation mm. because it's, mm. it's very, talk they say is cheap. And for us in this country, we talk a lot. But then when it comes down to the doing, it's pretty tough. Now, mm -hmm. if you walk into a police station, you see they're boldly written that bail is free. Have you ever been to a police station where you never paid to be bailed? It doesn't happen. So you said something about us being educated enough to know our rights. A couple of people do know their rights, yeah. but those rights are mostly always, if not more often than not, trampled upon by these same police officers who are supposed to know the, the contents of the law. They're the law enforcers, but then they are also trampling on the rights of the average Nigerian. But does the law really work in this country in terms of the fact that there are lots of things that we allow to hold sway that are against the law and trample on the rights of the average Nigerian. Look, we're still looking at the issue of um, the people who were killed at the toll gates. The federal government, um, the spokesperson for the government, um, the information Wait, minister, moment. calls it tales by moonlight. Another minister has come out to say that that panel in its first instance was um, illegal. So... Does the law really work? Even if you are very equipped and you know your rights, do those rights hold water? Oh, this is a very big question now being put on the hot seat. Okay, first of all, I guess we have laws that exist uh, um, to protect both the people um, that the government serves and those who serve us. Uh, Hassan, can you hear me? Uh, I think that we lost you there for a second. But um, Hassan, can you hear me? If you can hear me. 
Uh, I think that um, we have a little problem. I think we lost that audio. Uh, Abdullahi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. We lost right you now. for a second, but go ahead. Okay, so what I was saying actually is that um, the laws do exist in Nigeria, but they, they are not there to protect um, an average Nigerian, you know. So you have the police policing the population, but nobody is policing the police. And that's the problem. So until, there is, until the Police Service Commission, for instance, uh, takes that job seriously of policing the police and holding them accountable for their actions, they were not going to see much changes. That's what I see. And again, you need to have people who are educated. Are Nigerian police officers really educated? Are they? No, let's, let's even start with this. A couple of times I've come across police officers when driving home at night. You know, different check, checkpoints. They smell like breweries. They are drunk. And you, how can a drunken police officer really... Uh, I mean, think well and act well on duty. So there needs to be some sort of policing of the police itself. And that's why I guess that uh, there is no much checks. Hmm. Um, it, it's like something that I see happening in the U.S. Um, the police in the U.S. has um, some sort of labor group or uh, that covers the police. So if they're going to have, a police officer is going to be arraigned for something uh, um, reprimanded for something, there's always that pressure coming from that group, which is like the Police Service Commission. But in Nigeria, that Police Service Commission does not necessarily work. And even if they did, they would only be working in favor of the police. So who polices? I think that question, I'm putting it back to you. <laughs> the Police Service Commission. Now, let's not also forget the fact that welfare of these officers are a thing. The reason why we see the, the type of corruption... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the kind of actions that we see. I mean, I have been, I have been, I have seen a police officer who was also um, intoxicated, carrying a gun and, uh, you know, wearing um, flip-flops. Um, and I wondered, mm -hmm. at 8 p.m., he could release that bullet on anybody and nothing would be done because we also do not have a system that works in this country. So how do we, other than education, how do we go beyond educating Nigerians to know their rights? Because it's one thing to know your rights, but it's the other, for, it's the other thing for that right to mm. be put into action. So other than the Police Service Commission, how about our leaders, our legislators, our lawyers, even the NBA? What role are, we, are they supposed to play in making sure that all of this becomes a thing of the past or is reduced to its barest minimum? I'm not saying that Nigeria, you know, should you know, should be, you know, the, the best, have, have the best policing in the country. We know, I've been to Kenya, I've seen how Kenyan police officers are. Mm -hmm. They take bribes also. But we're supposed to be the big brother on, on this continent. What mm -hmm. kinds of examples are we showing? Oh, not too good example, really. Not too good. But again, if, if the institution that, uh, that was established with the sole mandate or purpose of police and the police failed to carry out its mandate or duties, then as a civil society, we also have other institutions that are supposed to interface, you know, on in some of these um, instances for us. And that still goes down to the fact that we need to be educated, uh, know some of the commissions that we do have in the country and what their mandates, responsibilities, duties and missions are. If we have this knowledge, then we can by far beat the system. Because, of course, the Police Service Commission will always protect the interests of the police. They don't want to be seen as doing anything bad or violating human rights. But this is it. You have the National Human Rights Commission. And I guess they have branches across the 36 states of Nigeria. You have the Public uh, Complaints Commission. I mean, just to mention these two for now. And in all of them, they have the legal department. If I guess people will learn to use these uh, commissions to, to uh, employ their services, this can be reduced. Now you're talking about the National Assembly. I don't, I don't see the National Assembly of Nigeria really protecting the interest of Nigerians. Oh, no, I don't. Because if they do... 
Uh, Abdullahi, I think that we're losing you, but I want to say thank you quickly. Abdullahi Hassan is a journalist uh, with WADR in Senegal. Thank you very much for speaking with us. We'll take a quick break now on Plus Politics and bring you the thoughts of Nigerians as to how we can deal with the issue of police brutality. What Nigeria can do about police brutality is to re-educate -edu um, the police people. They should organize for them and re-educate them to value people. So once they value people, then they begin to treat people nicely. So and they communicate pe with people correctly. I think education is very much important. They need to be educated. The Nigerian government should like. Uh, in fact, if there's any means to like uh, scrap police in Nigeria as a whole. I will be the happiest person. If the government can put in place some measures to change some people, put the people that are learned enough to tackle this issue of police brutality, because for me it's not really good, because the thing is really messing up, especially the young, the young youths at hand. You're really, really disturbing them. And for me, I don't really like this. You just reconsider some certain things and change a lot of things, especially the officers in charge of those kind of acts. That's a very big problem because the police also, they are angry and the an angry man is an a hungry man. So what I would say is let the federal government looking into police. In fact, if somebody is a thief, he's a thief, no matter what you do, you can give him billions of naira, he will continue stealing. But what I need is let them take them to a place that they will take them for, check their brain. If that person is okay before you give him the Nigerian police uniform because he is serving the masses and give them well good package. Give them package. Look at their station. If you go to their barracks, their station is nothing to write about. Uniform. They buy with their money. That is just it. Here's my take. Now, we've seen that the problem in this country is not necessarily the fact that we do not have laws. It's not necessarily that we do not have strategies on how to make sure that things work in this country. The problem in Nigeria is us, the people. Yes, because these police officers that we are complaining are brutalizing us, are stealing from us, are wrongly putting us behind bars. Our fathers, they are our brothers, they are uncles and our friends. But you see, every time we bring up the issue of police brutality in Nigeria, it seems it's like us versus the police. But the police officers do not understand that we're here fighting for their rights. So to the, to the police officer who's watching, we're not the enemy. We're not the problem. We're trying to fix the system. Yes, of course, every Nigerian needs to understand that they have rights. We all have rights. But how many of us understand those rights? So it's important. First things first, be educated on your rights. Know your rights then stand on those rights. But then on the other hand, the reason why we had NSARS in the first place was so that government will understand that they have a duty to these police officers. You cannot give them guns and not put food in their belly, pay them, kit them properly. You cannot give a man a gun. What do you expect to happen when you give a man a gun, a hungry person a gun? The problem is not us police officers. The problem is the leadership that we have in this country. They have continuously and not allowed for us to do the jobs that we've been assigned to do. And this goes beyond the police. It goes beyond the army. It is a Nigerian problem. You go to a civil service, uh, let's say ministry, they do not have what to work with. They basically don't. So you go there and they ask you to give them 1,000 so they can go and photocopy your paper and give it to you. But you say they're corrupt. No, the system is corrupt. And we, the people, need to start today. It, it, it starts with us, me, you, mom, dad, everybody. Do the right thing. Refuse to do the wrong thing, even if you're under pressure. Because if we start that way and start leaving our offices, we say, well, sir, if you're going to sack me, sack me. Tell the truth at all times. We're helping each other when we begin to stand on our right and do the right thing. Please say no to corruption because it's not just the politician who's corrupt. We aid and abate them. The commissioner that you're pointing fingers to, the minister who you're pointing fingers to, that man is able to steal monies because of the people who are in the system, the permanent secretaries, the directors, even the receptionists. We all have a role to play. For Nigeria to be a great country, we all have to say no to corruption. I am Mary Anakon. Have a good evening.